Welcome to the Profiles in Leadership series. It offers an unparalleled opportunity to glean insights from top leaders who serve in government, education, the private sector, and civil society. In each episode, we invite these leaders to reflect on their journey and share skills, core values, and qualities that make them the leaders they are today. Today, I am especially pleased to have two special guests. We have Esther Lim, who is Partner and Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Finnegan. She oversees the firm's diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies, initiatives, and goals. Esther has also served as the founding managing partner of Finnegan's Shanghai office and is a past president of the DC bar with 110,000 members. And I should say, proudly a member of our advisory board. And we also have John Yang, who is President and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. At AAJC, John leads the organization's efforts to fight for civil rights and empower Asian Americans to create a more just America for all through public policy, advocacy, education, and litigation. John served in the Obama administration as senior advisor for trade and strategic initiatives at the U.S. Department of Commerce, where he was the principal advisor to Secretary Penny Pritzker, Pritzker on issues related to Asia. Previously, John was a partner with a major Washington, D.C. law firm and also worked in Shanghai, China, for several years as the legal director for the Asia Pacific operations of ITW. Now, what a coincidence that you were both in Shanghai. Would you care to explain that coincidence? John? Uh, Esther, do you want to explain it? <laughs> well, I was in Shanghai when an opportunity came for me to serve as the founding managing partner to open Finnegan's China office. And at that time, I think John and I had been married for about a year and a half, <laughs> going on two years. So he took the leap of faith and uh, encouraged me to pursue this opportunity, and we moved to China together. Thanks. And, and I just wanted our viewers to understand that this is not a coincidence that we are actually having for the very first time two guests who are with us on this Profiles in Leadership series but there's a good reason for that. I think both of you have got really extraordinary careers in its, uh, their own right. But this, I think, is a special interview because uh, there's so many synergies between the things that both of you care deeply about and both of you do. So I thought it'd be interesting uh, to hear your perspectives together, sort of like the Obamas when they do an interview. You hear something different from when Barack and Michelle do it separately. <laughs> Well, we feel privileged to be in that status. <laughs> and you're right, in the introductions, I, I certainly missed the fact that the two of us have been married for, you know, since 2006. So, so that is obviously part of our biographies as well that might explain how we were both in Shanghai at the same time. <laughs> well, as long as you don't forget your anniversary. <laughs> that we know. <laughs> well, well, let's start with that uh interesting topic then. So both of you are leaders, but both of you are also partners in life. So tell us how that dynamic works. Well, from my perspective, I think a lot of it is around sort of coordination. A lot of it is around just the synergies that we share. I think one of the things, it's not a coincidence that sort of we're partners in life as well as partners in the work that we do together is part of what, I'll be honest, attracted me to Esther was the fact that sort of she was involved in the community, that she had this community-minded spirit. Uh, and so in that sense, it made a lot of sense for the, when the two of us started dating. And you know, at, once we got married, it was always part of who we were as a couple <laughs> in some ways. So in that sense, it, it was easy. And even now, Right. A lot of times we will talk about sort of books that we are reading that relate to racial justice topics or a speech that we heard or a particular area of debate. So in some ways, that's very, very natural. And, you know, I, I suppose one danger is that home life and work life bleed together in some ways. Uh, but overall, I think that's good. So so share some um tips and Esther feel free to jump in and, and add your thoughts to it on how you can keep that work and home life separate. 
Well, you know, one of the common questions that we're asked is how did we meet? Often couples are asked that question. And when we respond by saying that we met at a bar, there are significant eyebrows. <laughs> I, I guess uh, we're not really perceived as cool enough to be hanging out at bars. And uh, that may be true. We met at a bar called the Asian Pacific American Bar Association. And our uh, friendship and, and, and relationship grew through um, our mutual interest in getting involved with the community and serving others. And that theme has really carried out through our, throughout our um, relationships, first as friends and, and mutual support, um, then as partners in life. As I was coming through the leadership opportunities at Apapa DC, John was instrumental in guiding me and encouraging me to pursue those opportunities and to work together. Um, and also throughout marriage when professional opportunities both at work and outside of uh, work uh, arose, he was my champion in being um, uh, the lead supporter and an advocate um, and a strategist in how I navigated some times um, complex complexities, you know, often confronted by professionals. And that also applies in our, in how we juggle professional and personal responsibilities as parents. Um, we are very much partners in the truest sense of the word. John willingly um, takes on uh, more than his fair share of uh, parenting and household duties uh, without being, having to be asked. And uh, when he's busy at work and I need to pick up, we sort of have developed a natural rhythm over the years. Um, the benefit of marrying a lawyer is they actually understand what it is you do at work without you having to explain it. And so, um, you know, he understands when I'm on a business trip and I have a big meeting coming up or a deposition or preparing for a trial, uh, he gives me a lot of leeway um, and support because he understands what it takes to perform at that level. Similarly, in the work that John is doing now for Asian um, Americans, you know, in the very uh, sometimes volatile uh, space of human and civil rights and how do we protect that and ensure the rights of our community. Um, I know when things happen in the news that John will be unavailable <laughs> for a period of time because he's doing triage on behalf of the community and, and taking on that leadership role. So, um, and our kids are very understanding. They understand when mom or dad um, has to be away from home or can't join dinner or can't make it to concerts um, that it's because we're unable to be there, but that we would, they understand that we also try to, you know, uh, make our best efforts to, to be as present as possible. Uh, but it takes a lot of trust and support and it has really been critical in, in how we function as lawyers. Is he at least at some point in time an opa figure for you? <laughs> opa, um, big brother. Um, yes, it, in a way, because it's very much like family. Uh, we, we have a level of trust and um, mutual support and understanding that really underlies our relationship. And we try to instill that in our kids as well. Um, and they understand the space that we work in and they are able to talk about um, racism, um, their personal experiences, um, things that go on in the news and media, in the political arena, and just growing up with that awareness um, because they are exposed to that early on, it's, it's really a privilege. Let, let's talk about the theme that you had touched upon briefly in your remarks, and that's being an Asian leader. So you have been, both of you have been Asian leaders for most of your lives now, in your professional lives, and certainly uh, 
you know, even outside. But talk about what it means to each of you being an immigrant Asian leader. What are some of the quirks of it you've noticed compared to, say, other uh, leaders in other racial demographics? What are some of the perks? Certainly, in terms of quirks, I would say is it's still a pretty small community if you're talking about Asian leaders, right? And it speaks to the fact that Esther and I are here together. And that, that's part of it. It's like it's a growing community, but it's still relatively small. You know, all of us share fairly similar last names. Obviously, the two of you share the same last name. Uh, there are many Yangs in the world that are in the community. And typically, we all, all often get the question, hey, are you related to each other? Not recognize that like Yang is the fourth most common surname in China, or Lim is probably the second or third most common surname in Korea. But nevertheless, even if we aren't related to each other, the perk is, or perhaps it's a quirk, is that probably within one or two degrees of separation, we actually do know each other. So I, I value that. I value that it's a, it's a small, tight-knit community. The other perk I would offer is that being Asian immigrant, uh, that means typically at our events, we have good food. That, that sounds quirky, perhaps. That sounds very, very small. But in terms of building community, in terms of finding commonalities to build from, I actually would not underestimate the, the value of that. Yeah, we, we, we are uh, siblings of different mothers with the same white dad. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be clear, uh, Don Dana. Uh, connected us and uh, it, it was uh, one of the, I tell Esther and, and I mean that sincerely, the, the last and best uh, gift that he gave to me was this friendship that I have with Esther. And, and, and for those listeners out there, let's just clarify the record. Uh, Daryl is not my opa, he's my younger brother. He's my <laughs> <friend thing. laughs> um, But I, I do uh, credit Don Dunner uh, with lots of things, um, mentorship, um, friendship over the years and, and support, um, being my teacher um, in all things related to law and professionalism. Uh, but his lasting legacy and gift to me personally has been to connect me to Daryl Lim. Um, when Don came to me one day and said, you need to meet your brother. <laughs> and eventually Daryl and I will navigate the pandemic and, and meet in person, but we got to know each other uh, because we also have uh, similar values in um, realizing the importance of IP, but also social justice and giving back to the community. So we have been working together in the virtual world through seminars and, and, and initiatives and boards um, to promote to promote diversity in the legal profession. We also share a common love of food. So I echo John's remarks about the importance of food and um, the role that culture and customs play in our relationships. Thanks. Now, I, I wanna now take each of you down a, a, se a separate route and reflect uh, on your careers separately. Uh, but you know, feel free to jump in if comments uh, as, as the other spouse, if, if you like. Now, John, let's first talk uh, uh, with you about your journey from Asia Pacific American Legal Resource Center to where you are now with, at A, uh, is it AAPJ? A A A AAJC is typically. AAJC. Yes, yeah, that's the easy name, right. And since this is a Profiles and Leadership uh, series, focus on the leadership lessons that you have drawn uh, in your professional journey. Sure, and so uh, Daryl talked about the Asian Pacific American Legal Resource Centers. This is, and actually there's the poster to this side of me. That's the first poster that we created for that organization. It was an organization that was dedicated to provide direct legal services here in the Washington DC metropolitan area. There had never been a service of that type for the Asian American community prior to that. Uh, and so this was when I was still a senior associate at the firm that I was at, Wiley, Ryan and Fielding, or then it was called Wiley, Ryan and Fielding. And it was a partnership with a number of Georgetown law students, a uh, 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 student by the name, now really you know, well-known uh, attorney by the name of Sean Park, 
that came to me when I was president of APABA DC with this idea of saying st starting this legal re uh, resource center. And it just made a lot of sense. And so it was a question pulling the community together, uh, members of APABA DC, et cetera, and putting, putting it together and having a supportive firm to do that. So like certainly in terms of leadership lessons, number one is that it does take a community, right? It, it really requires people to be bold in their thinking. I, I, there are certain, certainly times when we were like, well, we're not sure if we have the budget for this. And all of us had the adventure spirit of, you know, if we build it, it will come, so to speak, right? Uh, and that we can't sort of be too stymied by what if it fails. Uh, so that's certainly a lesson that I learned there. And bringing it forward to sort of where I am now at AAJC, I, I think it's a question of just like recognizing that you never know where your life goes. Uh, you know, if you look at my bio, actually, this is the first time I've had held a full-time position at a civil rights organization. Prior to that, I was really more on the commercial side, if you will, both as a, a litigator at a law firm, in-house counsel at ITW, Illinois Tool Works. Even in the government, I was working on trade. It, it wasn't a civil rights uh, opportunity. But it was because of the 2016 elections that I decided to make that shift, right? And to say, I, I need to lean into our community in a different way at that time. And I have to say, I, I will give a huge amount of credit to, to Esther as in terms of steps along this journey. Because as probably people that are watching this will know, when you go from in-house counsel uh, at a Fortune 200 company to a government position, the pay, there's a pay cut that's involved, a pretty significant pay cut that's involved. But Esther didn't flinch at that. I mean, she recognized that I had always been interested in working in the government to have this ability to, to have this role within the Obama administration was just a wonderful opportunity. So she was very supportive of that. Then after the Obama administration, as I was thinking about what to do, because uh, as, as we all know, so if the Obama administration was coming to a close, uh, Trump was going to become president. Uh, I was trying to figure out my next steps. This opportunity came along and I was very intrigued because I used to serve as board chair for this organization. Uh, so I was intrigued by it, but it's a nonprofit, which uh, obviously doesn't pay that well either. And again, es Esther didn't flinch. She was like, yeah, this is, she could tell that this was something that I was just deeply motivated by and that really spoke to a passion that I had. And she was just like, jump into it, you know, go for it. Um, and so I think the other piece of leadership that I took away from that, I would ask people to think about is like, make sure you have a support ne network around you uh, that, that allows you to be bold at times, will give you good advice, you know, to say, you know, even when it's like, sometimes at night she's just like, John, just put it down. It'll be there tomorrow. That's important to, to, for all of us to recognize as well, because most of this stuff will be, and we do have to pace ourselves. So those are a few data points along the way. Thank you. Uh, worth your weight and go. Esther, now you have done a tremendous amount, and I have had the good fortune of being at the front row seat just recently in celebrating those achievements at the 20th anniversary of the Institute for IP and Social Justice's CLE program. And during your remarks, and John, you weren't there, but she gave a beautiful speech. One of the things that she mentioned, which I remember, is she quoted a Korean proverb where she said something, and you, you can uh, put, set me straight, Esther, if I'm uh, misquoting it. Even mountains and rivers change in 10 years. Uh, and you use that to describe the efforts uh, in the space of IP and social justice. So tell us about uh, your process and your role in that and what leadership lessons you drew. And by the way, if you can say in Korean, that proverb, all the better. <laughs> that is often said in the Korean culture to reflect on change over time. Uh, even though we think that something as sturdy as mountains and, and rivers uh, are, should be consistent over the years. Um, and so it really speaks to um, the concept that John referred to earlier about um, taking risks and being open-minded about 
the future of opportunities. The IP and social justice intersection came to me in 2003 um, by Professor Latif Amtima, who is the visionary um, at Howard University School of Law, who, with whom I had the privilege of um, working with and collaborating and partnering with over the last 20 years. He met a, a partner at my firm, um, Tom Irving, uh, at an IP conference uh, just around the time of September 11. And as they were traveling between conferences uh, for their next presentation, uh, they were on this long bus ride where they would share a lot of ideas and visions. One of which um, Professor Mtima shared about how we promote social justice in the space of intellectual property. At that time, I had been in the IP space for about eight years. I had never heard of social justice being used in the same sentence as IP. And when Latif Mtima came to my firm to meet with a handful of us to talk about his vision and how Finnegan can help in that process, um, it really opened my eyes. I jumped in right away. I said, yes, I'd love to help and be part of the team. We first started by developing a new course um, on uh, patent policy uh, to teach at Howard that talks about the intersection of the rights of the, the IP holders and the rights of the public and how we balance that, uh, whether it's access to drugs or access to high tech. Um, and so uh, through that relationship, we also uh, had the opportunity to support um, from the first conference, the IP and social justice conference, which launched in 2003. I would, because I clerked at the federal circuit, I, I knew a number of judges on that court, as well as uh, through my bar association uh, leadership activities. Um, John and I knew a number of um, district court judges and, and others. And so uh, I was able to activate those relationships to come and support the IP and social justice conference at Howard from year one. The first speaker from the federal circuit was uh, Judge Paul Michel. Uh, who has been a staunch supporter of that conference and all initiatives um, relating to IP and DEI and social justice at Howard and beyond. Um, we, that conference has grown over the years to scales that we could not have imagined when we started truly grassroots uh, in 2003. And uh, on the backs of uh, student volunteers from Howard, we were able to run the first conference um, at the Howard Law School uh, Auditorium. And we've been running that conference um, every year, um, including the pandemic, we transitioned to virtual. And as Daryl knows, this year in 2023, we were finally able to get back to in-person, but we um, made the conference available for hybrid. One of the key principles behind the conference is really access. Access to information, access to technology, and access to intellectual property rights, both for practitioners and, and also for law school students to see the possibility of IP careers in their future. When you've been doing something long enough, you actually see uh, your efforts come to fruition, and there are many fruits that bore over the years. And we have stellar Howard graduates at major corporations, um, you know, serving as key IP leads um, in, in, in various capacities. And they come back and give back to the Howard program as well as speakers, lecturers. And it's really great to see the growth of the Howard community um, as a, a leading HBCU um, in the country to take a prominent role in, in, in the growth of IP in spaces that IP would not otherwise be present. And it's just been an enormous privilege to be a part of that growth. Now, have you ever invited John for your CLE? <laughs> I understand he probably needs CLE too. 
I, I'm not qualified to speak at, at her conferences. <laughs> no, you, you can attend and get CLE. Well, that is true. <laughs> yeah, in, in fact, this year, as you know, uh, you both know, it, it, Finnegan hosted it. Uh, and it was a wonderful conference. And Esther, you have been doing a lot of good work in the DEI space at Finnegan long before you became Chief Diversity Inclusion Officer. So was there a connection, you think, between those efforts at Howard and the Institute for IP and Social Justice that paved you know, the way eventually for you to help those, the DEI efforts at Finnegan? There's definitely a common thread. When I first got involved with a Papa DC, the Asian um, Pacific American Bar Association. It was at a time, it, you know, in the late '90s, um, where diversity was not even talked about at organizations as a principle uh, or a vision. DEI had not even been coined as a term. So John and I started practicing law in an era that looks vastly different in terms of diversity um, than we experience today. What we started doing um, over 20 years ago was really driven by our personal experiences and beliefs in the importance of the role of lawyers to give back to the community and to help those in need. That's it, plain and simple. It came in various different shapes. Uh, one was, uh, AAPI related bar associations. They're also community based organizations and nonprofits, uh, including um, the predecessor to AHAC. <laughs> and um, also, Howard was a way in which I uh, lived by those beliefs. Um, you know, I've been teaching there for now, um, starting 20 years ago, and I've been involved with the conference. Um, uh, for, for a similar amount of time. And I've been doing that every year because um, I just really believe it's important for uh, lawyers to take an active role in uh, making someone's life better. Uh, for me at Howard, that meant sharing the knowledge about patents and IP careers with students who probably never had been exposed or felt that they weren't qualified enough to pursue those careers uh, because of a lack of STEM backgrounds or maybe their, the schools that they went, whatever their experiences are, um, you know, making those opportunities real for them to see someone, uh, to see a woman of color as a partner at a major IT firm uh, can be really empowering. Um, and to see, you know, my colleagues teach, who teach with me, many of whom are also diverse, seeing them, um, they can see themselves and the possibilities. And so um, I, we, you know, both John and I have been doing various sorts of community-based volunteer work. And for me, uh, there was no blueprint of a career that I envisioned as an eventual partner in CDIO. Uh, in fact, those positions did not even exist. <laughs> um, but through the work, it seems that I've been working towards a new job at the same organization where I grew up as a baby lawyer. And it's just been an, a fortuitous, fortuitous outgrowth of what I've been doing because I believe in the things that I'm, I do and I'm passionate about it. Well, do you both see this as a vindication of the, the, the rightness of your cause that society finally caught up in a sense in recognizing the importance of the work that you do and are willing to to recognize it in terms of the formal job description, which now is becoming more and more uh, commonplace. I don't see it so much as a vindication. I, I think it's an expression of the enormous need that existed that is finally getting at least some outlet um, to, um, to make things better. It took George Floyd for many corporations and law firms to wake up and redouble their efforts by creating dedicated uh, chief level leaders um, to take on these roles. Um, and so it, 
for me, it's not really a vindication or a celebration, rather a reflection of how much need there still is. Uh, the fact that John can basically work 24 seven, seven days a week, and still yet there's so much work to be done in that space is a, is a, it's just a reflection of where we are today and how much farther we have to go. John, it sounds like Esther saying you need to hire more people because <laughs> she's not going to see you at home enough. Uh, John, would you like to reflect on that, that same question? Where, where are we today? And yeah, I mean, I think I think Esther's right. As part of it is, I am an optimist by nature, and I do think that the moral bend of the universe, to, to paraphrase uh, Martin Luther King, is an arc towards justice. And so what we are seeing right now is that arc towards justice. Now, to be clear, uh, where I might differ is I'm not sure that that arc is a natural arc, as opposed to some type of zigzag line or a sine wave of some sort. You know, what we have seen are ups and downs. We saw progress, but then to be very blunt, we, we had a, a, an administration that took us backwards by several years. Uh, we had George Floyd, we had the murders in Atlanta. So we are in this time where there's push and pull, uh, a, a pull towards justice, but also a push against it. So this is why it's so important for all of us to be talking about having these conversations. And I so much appreciate you, Daryl, for talking about these issues very directly, because when we get a chance to do that, I think we are pushing that arc uh, a little bit further, a little bit more quickly than we might naturally do. You know, I don't think that Esther was exaggerating when she says if something comes up, John is just not there because everybody, every news outlet wants to talk to you. And in, in preparing for our conversation today, I was just amazed at the, the variety of outlets that have uh, that you've appeared on, including uh, 88 Rising, which, you know, I thought was a social justice thing. But then when I looked at it, not that there, it, it was hip hop, it was, you know, music, it was this uh, really targeting I think your kids' generation, right? So how, how did that come about? And uh, talk to us about how you've leveraged on the media. Uh, I really appreciate you bringing up that example, Daryl, because uh, frankly, when they approached us about doing something for the Asian American community, I actually had to ask my staff, well, who is this? Is this reputable? And when they looked at the artist, they're like, oh, this is, these are some of the biggest names in, in sort of Asian American pop culture. I'm like, Okay, that's all right. Um, and so this was during early 2020 when we were first seeing that spike, that rise in anti-Asian hate. 88 Rising is a, a group that is dedicated to Asian talent and not just Asian American, but Asian talent. And they wanted to do something for our community. And so they reached out to us to do a concert. Uh, it was virtual because of the pandemic and, and to feature us and fundraise for us. And we just thought that was brilliant, right? Because this speaks to how we push towards justice. Because obviously an organization like mine, we work on advocacy, we work on policies here on the Hill, we litigate to try to get changes to voting rights laws or immigration laws. Uh, but in order to change narrative, we need so much more than that. We need those pop artists to, to be talking about these issues. And so to have that different venue, I think the other venue that I, I always laugh about, and, and Esther and I laugh about, I can see her smile, is, is when I, I actually appeared on the Trevor Noah show. <laughs> and that all, also garnered sort of uh, kudos from our kids. They're like, oh, that they kind of get. Um, and then I did a subsequent interview with Ronnie Chang, who was from the Trevor Noah show. And I have to say, on one level, that was probably the most awkward interview for me in the sense that I'm used to talking to like the, the normal political pundit type people with standard questions. To have someone that is a little bit irreverent, uh, will use swear words occasionally, make fun of me at the same time that he is promoting a cause that all of us agree on was both uncomfortable, but just wildly uplifting for me because that's the sort of audience that we also need to make our movement grow, to make that sustainable. And so to have those opportunities and to leverage them, you know, when you think about uh, Hamilton, the, the musical Hamilton, one of the things that I always remark on, uh, Esther and I have seen it twice together. Uh, she's seen it one extra time. We won't talk about why, why that is. Uh, um, one of the biggest applause lines from Hamilton, if you've ever seen the show, is when they, they sing, immigrants get the job, we get the job done. And that says something about how pop culture 
transcends just that entertainment culture, but can actually make change for what all of us believe in. Thank you. Now, you talk about partners, and I think partnership is an important aspect of the leadership roles that both of you play. Uh, John, you have done an interview together with the uh, head of NAACP, and Esther, you, you are one of the leaders of the US IP Alliance and one of the prime movers on the DEI efforts uh, at the US IP Alliance. So talk about how working with partners uh, amplifies your work. And if you like some of the challenges that might come up about as a result of that partnership. I, I think partnerships are critical in everything that we do, particularly in the DEI space, because it is not about one segment of diverse community. There's so many different segments with common barriers and challenges and issues that, and both John and I believe that we're much stronger together than divided. Um, and so we try to focus on commonalities, how we can um, build on our allyships, uh, among different communities, among different segments, in different practice settings, um, to bring our um, resources together and pull together rather, rather than um, thinking more microscopically about who's getting the bigger slice of the pie today. Uh, but it, it's more a question about growing the pie collectively so that we are better represented across the board um, in various segments of the profession. Yeah, I completely agree with that. So, oh, Sherilyn Eiffel, who was then the uh, legal, uh, then the director, counsel general for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and I sat down for what's called the Washington Post Live session, where we talked about race in America. And why I thought that was so important was oftentimes the Asian American community is pitted somewhat against the African American community. Whether it is an education space where there's these false narratives around affirmative action and where Asian Americans stand, which is that we generally support it. Whether it is around even on anti-Asian hate where we have seen misinformation about this notion that it is the African American that is attacking us when they actually underrepresent the number of anti-Asian hate incidents that we've been tracking. So it's important for us to come together to show how we are actually together in this. It, it's not lost on me that at the same time we had George Floyd is within the same year that we had the Atlanta murders, that we had the insurrection at the Capitol. It's part of the same narrative that all of us are facing. And so to make sure that we're presenting that common image and what all of us bring to this fight that we have, the struggles that we have it, is critical. I, I think the other aspect of that is the different roles that we play. You know, I, certainly for me, the metaphor that I use is, is not one of a melting pot. Oftentimes people talk about America being a melting pot. I actually don't agree with that. And uh, I apologize to Esther because she's heard my analogy about this many, many times. I've been workshopping it with her. Um, I actually think that when you talk about a melting pot, this notion is that we all have to give away something of ourselves, melt a little bit to be part of this image of America, which is this great and wonderful place. My own image is that of a mixed salad, if we're going to stay with the food analogies as, as we began this interview. This notion is that we don't have to melt away any part of ourselves. Rather, each of us bring our own individual ingredients, whether it is a tomato, whether it is an olive, whether it's an, a, a piece of lettuce, that individually mean something and may even taste good. But by coming together while retaining our individuality, we are even better as a, a food item. I think that is probably a better metaphor. Obviously, we can play with that because I don't want people to be giving up of themselves. The last thing I would say about this is oftentimes we have heard Martin Luther King's quote that I don't want to be judged. My, I don't want my children to be judged based on the color of their skin, but the content of their character to argue that we that that we should be talking about race blindness and that any type of affirmative action or policies that distinguish between races is problematic. My problem with that is we don't live in a race blind society and it's going to be a long time before we get there. So rather we should celebrate our differences and how we bring them together rather than pretend something that it's not. 
Because if, if we are really talking about race blindness, let's let's face it, you know, poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses, all of those are nominally race blind, but we all know the discriminatory effects of those policies. So likewise, let's not kid ourselves about where we are in society, but rather recognize those differences, celebrate them, and think about how we use them to come together. Thank you. I love the salad analogy. Uh, now, help us make sense of the tensions between U.S. and China. Oh, if I might interject, now that I'm thinking about it in the Asian context, maybe it's maybe it's something like bibimbap. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that too, yes. <laughs> uh, so, so talk about China. You, both of you have spent a good amount of time in China. You are, understand probably better than many people in this country, the culture, the people there. Uh, take us beyond the headlines and reflect on where we are as a country with respect to China, uh, given the tensions, of course, between the US and China, and really vividly portrayed uh, with the phrase Kung flu when COVID hit and uh, the Asian population was vilified for that. Uh, where are we now and, and, and how do we proceed? Maybe I'll start on this one. Uh, we're in a difficult spot and it's not going to get easier for the next several years because the reality is that we do have real geopolitical tensions with the Chinese government. You know, whether it is human rights with respect to the Uyghur Muslim minority in Xinjiang, democracy in Hong Kong, free speech for Chinese citizens. We, as a government, certainly, the United States government has a right and should call out the Chinese government on some of these policies. At the same time, we must be very, very clear that this isn't about two cultures, two societies that are opposed to each other. That's where we end up with the hate, more generally, not just Chinese Americans, but Asian Americans generally. Historically, we've always had that problem. You know, when we were at war with the Japanese Empire in World War II, we had Americans of Japanese descent that were incarcerated. When we had terror, uh, the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Centers in 2001, 9-11, we had backlash, literally murders of a couple of South Asian Americans because of uh, being profiled as being somehow being terrorists. So that's what we have to be careful about right now. We need to celebrate how Asian Americans have contributed to the strength of this country, security of this country, prosperity of this country. At the same time, recognize that there are going to be some of these political tensions, policy tensions, and figure out how to work on them together. Thank you. I, I noticed Esther has been quiet for a while, so I'm going to start uh, with my last question. Uh, it's going to be a bim bim bap style question, two questions rolled in one. I, I, I want to just quickly get your thoughts on leadership lessons that you might have learned from Mrs. Herbert, but also in reflecting about the year ahead, what we should expect from Esther Lim. And same for you, John. Uh, you can talk about Mrs. Herbert if you want, but t tell us also uh, what we should be looking out for uh, in the year to come for you. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, Mrs. Herbert is uh, an angel in my life. I immigrated to this country when I was 12 years old, not speaking any English, and was plopped down at a local middle school as a seventh grader in the final month of that academic year. It, it was a period of great turmoil um, and, and challenge for me personally and also academically where I could perform no academic work. I was basically uh, shepherded from classroom to classroom and sat there like a log. <laughs> and uh, one thing that Mrs. Jean Herbert, who later I would realize this was her first year of teaching. And because be had, she had become a teacher at the age of 45 after raising her three sons, um, and, and the year that she graduated summa cum laude from Towson University, which will later also be my alma mater, uh, she was unable to get a teaching job because of a hiring freeze at Harford County at that time. And so she was acting as a substitute science teacher when I walked into her classroom, basically deaf and mute. Um, and she noticed this Asian girl, and I was the only Asian student in this whole school. 
Um, she saw someone different, but she exhibited one of her lifelong characteristics and that was generosity. And that was helping someone in need. She saw a student in need who was unable to really perform at any level um, and inability to communicate at all. Um, so she started helping me. She, she bought a book, a coloring book for kids and um, started teaching me words like girl, boy, playground. And so she effectively became my English teacher. Um, the other principle is she saw possibilities and not limits. She somehow, despite the fact that we couldn't communicate at all, she saw the potential in me, not based on performance, but the, the ability to, to learn and to grow. And so she would teach not only me, but my siblings and my mom um, completely free of charge, English over successive summers. Um, and she made an enormous difference in my life uh, because I was able to, uh, by ninth grade, uh, perform on par with my peers uh, as a student, and it would prepare me, eventually prepare me for college. She's still a very close family friend. Um, and so I try to exhibit those principles uh, in the way I work with my colleagues at the firm and also as a teacher at Howard Law School. Um, not seeing performance metrics, but seeing the potential. What lies ahead for me this year? I am so thrilled about the various um, new initiatives to uplift um, diverse students and professionals in, in the IP space, whether it's Finnegan IP University or launching a new IP summit this summer, as you know, Daryl. Uh, focused on increasing representation of Black and African American students in, in IP careers. Um, and there are a number of other exciting um, initiatives that we're about to roll out and, and really rolling up our sleeves to, to work on together as a firm, um, you know, on the management committee level, on the leadership level. So I'm really excited about what lies ahead, both at the firm, but also working with various organizations like USIPA and others um, to, to promote change, positive change. Thank you. Last word to you, John. I'm so thankful for Mrs. Herbert as well, because obviously without someone like her, uh, Esther would not be the wonderful person that she is today. Obviously she would have been a wonderful person. I'm not sure I would have met her in the same way without someone like that. I think the last message I would leave is that leaders come in all sorts of guises, including someone like Mrs. Herbert, is sometimes you think about leaders and you know both Esther and I are very privileged to be in the positions that we are, where we are more public facing and are able to do interviews like this. But there are so many leaders that, that quote unquote lurk in the background or are in the background that do wonderful things. Uh, and so what I would encourage everyone that watches this is like uh, to ask all of you to be a Mrs. Herbert to someone ask all of you to do something that quote unquote might seem small, but actually makes a huge amount of difference because if each of us does our little share, our piece of that puzzle, then that mosaic comes together, that puzzle comes together in a very, very beautiful way. So you know, don't always think about leadership as that big thing. Also think about leadership as those little things that you can do throughout the year, throughout the day that could just show a little bit of caring that in part will help us to create that society that we all seek. Thank you. I couldn't, have, I couldn't have said that better. We collectively celebrate all of the unsung heroes and leaders. Well, thank you, Esther, John, for all the good work that you do and for joining us for this uh, interview. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daryl.